All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And this is a little unique, uh, but welcome to Bears in the Know. And we appreciate Arvest for sponsoring this. And uh, for those uh, that are joining on Zoom, my name is Brent Dunn, Executive Director of the Missouri State Foundation. And of course, we uh, normally do these every other month. Uh, but then uh, something happened at the end of February, the first of March, and so we decided to, to not uh, actually do uh, Bears in the Know for a while. But since then, we've, we've been changing a lot of things and, and knowing we can do things safe, uh, we're starting to have events again. Uh, we probably, the first event uh, at the university probably occurred at the end of July. And so, as you know, we had commencement uh, during uh, homecoming, uh, and uh, we can do things safely. Uh, so in the room, we have uh, several people, but we're scattered about. We had uh, uh, lobster and steak for lunch, so those <laughs> was, uh, lobster and steak. Uh, that's not true, but we had a great lunch. Uh, but this is unique because we're actually joined on Zoom uh, from people really across the country. Uh, over 125 people have joined in wow. on our Zoom broadcast. And uh, so uh, we're doing, uh, while there, COVID is not the thing we wanted, it has uh, prompted us to do a lot of things virtually. And after COVID ends, we'll probably continue to do a lot of things virtually and in person as well, because we can actually involve lots more people. Uh, the Missouri State Foundation had their annual meeting uh, during the homecoming, uh, October 17th, and uh, we did the meeting both in person and in Zoom, and literally we had people from coast to coast that joined us that probably couldn't make it down to Springfield, uh, and so even after COVID, uh, we've learned a lot during this time, and so uh, there'll be some good things from that. Uh, before we're going to turn it over to uh, Cliff Smart, uh, who always gives us a, a welcome and gives us a university update, as we get into the uh, program and discussion, those on Zoom, uh, you can use your chat button, uh, either at the top or the bottom, uh, type in your questions, and then we'll uh, certainly ask that uh, during the Q&A, and certainly the folks here, uh, you don't have to do that, you can just shout it out. And we'll try to do this in a orderly fashion. Uh, but before we get into the program, do want to welcome Cliff Smart, uh, university president, who uh, is uh, live from his office. And uh, we'll have uh, Cliff give us an update from the university. All right, thanks, Brent. I need Stephanie. I need you to uh, start my video so people can see me. Got it. Perfect. Welcome, everyone, uh, and uh, thanks for joining us today. I think we all needed uh, a distraction from just watching election returns all day, and so uh, uh, again, thanks everyone for for being a part of this. Um, uh, thought I'd hit just uh, kind of uh, the two major things we're uh, we focus we're focusing on um, this year, this semester. Obviously, a piece of that is managing through the the pandemic, as Brent has talked about. Um, and I would tell you that is going uh, very well. Um, if you all haven't checked, uh, we have a dashboard up on our homepage of the website, you can with one click uh, get there and, and see how the university is doing. And so for example, if you look at that dashboard today, you'll see that we've had 39 positive cases, mostly students within the last seven days. We tested 370 people. Uh, we have only 14 in isolation or quarantine uh, right now. And uh, for the last uh, five weeks, we have been consistently at or below 
50 new cases a week. And so um, that's very uh, positive. Um, as a result of those numbers, um, we're uh, anticipating finishing the semester as set forth on the calendar. And so we'll take a break at Thanksgiving and come back for the final week of classes. Um, and then um, uh, uh, final exams and graduations uh, on, uh, we'll do three this year so that we can spread folks out um, on December 11th. We're also anticipating a spring calendar to be as uh, as designed at this point. Again, the numbers don't uh, give us a justification to change. Um, we are, however, of course, managing events. And so as we think about going into basketball season, uh, capacity at the queue is going to be capped at about 3,500 people. Um, and uh, other, other events are either downsized or postponed. And, that, and that's going to go through March as we wait and see kind of what the status of the vaccine development is and, and the logistics on getting that out and how we do in the cold weather. And so again, we contingency plan for, for a whole series of possibilities, but, but right now um, things have gone uh, as, as, as good as we could have hoped for uh, for this semester. The other good thing is uh, revenue for the state of Missouri is, uh, is better than anticipated. And so the governor recently released uh, $1.6 million to us that had been uh, withheld. Uh, enrollment this semester came in uh, way above projections. And so uh, we feel good about where we are uh, financially, again, recognizing that there's some unknowns coming uh, particularly in December, January, February, as we work through uh, the winter months. The other big thing we're working on is strategic planning. And so there are three big documents that are up for uh, uh, redesign and, and, and creation this semester. Uh, one is the visioning guide where we plan out uh, 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 new capital projects uh, or the renovation of current uh, buildings to Two big projects underway is the beginning of the re renovation of what we used to call the professional building and is now Ann Campeter uh, Health Sciences Hall. Um, and then um, we had a meeting this morning on the next phase of the uh, permanent tent theater structure. Uh, about half the money needed for that project has been raised and uh, we'll continue to focus on that and would anticipate that project going to bid in March. The other two big pieces are a, are a, a strategic enrollment management plan uh, as we look into the future and, and changes that need to be made as a, as a result of, of new technology and new delivery methods, et cetera. That will be finalized at the end of the year. And then this is the year that we create a new long range plan um, and, and many, many, uh, many of our friends and, and uh, uh, alums from the university will have an opportunity in the spring semester to participate in a virtual webinar like this to give us your thoughts as we work on what are the next five years at uh, Missouri State University look like. Uh, I'm excited about those years, uh, no matter who the president of the United States is. Good things are happening here, and, uh, and so we continue to to have the, the vision to, to grow and uh, both the profile and the enrollment um, and the quality uh, of our programs uh, at the university. Brent, I'll turn it back to you. over $206 million, so we still have ways to go to $250 million, uh, but we anticipate getting that uh, by the year 2022 or somewhere during that year. We've added a lot of new scholarships just in the last uh, three to four weeks as well, so uh, scholarships will always be a, a crucial part. Well, this is the um, uh, bears in the know, and we always learn something uh, about uh, what's going on at the university. So I'm going to bring up uh, Tammy Yonke 
Tammy is the Dean of the College of Natural and Applied Sciences, who will uh, introduce the program and give us an update from what's going on in the college. Thank you, Brent, for that introduction. Want to give you a little bit of an update about the College of Natural and Applied Sciences and what's happening there. Students and faculty in the college have been doing some pretty amazing things this last year. For example, Dr. Krista Evans is an assistant professor of human geography and planning. A spring student project in her planning studio, which was called Seeds for Downtown Success, a downtown plan for Seymour, Missouri, won the 2020 State American Planning Association Award for Outstanding Student Project. Our students and faculty are working on real issues to help real communities. The Cooperative Engineering Program with Missouri S&T expanded last year to add mechanical engineering. We are just now completing the final renovations at the e-factory for the new engineering spaces. We have nearly 80 mechanical engineering students that have already started as freshmen and sophomores, along with 200 civil and electrical engineering students. I expect that we will have over 400 engineering students in Springfield in the next two years. Faculty have been successful in gaining access to external funding for their research. And external funding is important because it pays for new instrumentation, it pays for research supplies, and it can also pay salaries for additional graduate students and undergraduate students to work in the labs. Dr. Ryan Udan, Associate Professor of Biology, was awarded a grant from the National Institute of Health this year. His research group seeks to understand how blood vessel related birth defects form. And this is really important since congenital heart defects affect nearly 40,000 births in the United States each and every year. Missouri State University is making a difference in the health and welfare of our nation. And the final example is new funding from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Gary Mickelfelder, Associate Professor of Geology, leads research at five active volcanoes in the central Andes of Chile and Bolivia. There are many unanswered questions about how, how and why volcanoes erupt. And it's important for us to find those answers. Dr. Mickelfelder and Missouri State University students will be there to find those answers. So in order to support the students and faculty in the college to do this kind of research and, to, and all the work that we do, the College of Natural and Applied Sciences finished a one-year planning study to help us understand the amount of additional space required for the college. The study concluded that even though we have 155,000 square feet for biology, chemistry, geography, geology, planning, physics, astronomy, material science, math, and computer science, we really need closer to 240,000 square feet. Many of you might know of Temple Hall, which is the latest building um, for the sciences. It was built in the early 70s when the student population on campus had just broken 10,000 students. We have over doubled that in 2020. So we looked at new buildings, but new science buildings are very, very expensive. So we've settled on a three phase plan with significant additions to Temple Hall and to Cheek Hall to meet the needs of the college and the university. Phase one is, is estimated to cost $42 million. The funding plan will, would include using college student fees, university general funding and private funding. I have been challenged to find $15 million in private money. I'm up for the challenge and have been meeting with folks since September. Let me know if you'd like to chat with me after today. So one of my jobs today is to introduce Dr. Toby Dogweiler. He arrived on the Missouri State University campus in the summer of 2015 as the new department head of geography, geology, and planning. His bachelor's degree is from Wittenberg University, a master's degree from Mississippi State University, 
and his PhD is from Mizzou, right here in the state. He teaches environmental geology, water resources, and landscape analysis. Toby is broadly trained in field-based and remote monitoring of surface processes and watershed dynamics with an emphasis on environmental issues in karst terrains and agricultural areas. Currently, his primary research focus is on the development and application of methodologies for drone-based remote sensing related to environmental, agricultural, and conservation problems. Please help me welcome to the podium, Dr. Toby Dogweiler, who's going to be talking about transforming drones from flying cameras to scientific tools for managing the natural resources of the Ozarks. Toby. Was working, wasn't it? <laughs> I'll let you advance for me, Stephanie. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tammy, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the MSP <coughs> Foundation for inviting me to uh, speak to everybody today. Um, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about what I do um, in my research, but uh, if we can advance, I thought maybe I'd start a little bit about just who this guy is up here. So. Um, a little bit about me, just briefly. My family and I, my wife and daughter, we like to travel, so uh, that's what we do whenever we can. We've been fortunate to go all over the world, and uh, if I'm not traveling or hanging out with the two of them, where you're probably going to find me if I'm not at work is on my bike or running. Um, if I could do that full time, that would be my full time job, but I'm not quite good enough, so I do this instead, and I'm lucky to have that. <laughs> all right, we can go to the next one. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to inter introduce my department. Um, around campus, we're called GGP. Uh, the, G, the G is geography, the second G is geology, and then planning, community and regional planning. Um, at the end there, there's also a silent G that's unpronounced, and that's for geospatial science. That's the fourth major we offer in our department. So these are all separate majors housed in one department, but they're all inter interrelated disciplines. And um, today, when we talk about drones, we'll be talking about an aspect of geospatial science. But you're going to see that, uh, just like with drones, all of geospatial science links back out to these other disciplines and many others, uh, computer science, information technology, archaeology, um, even business and, and uh, social sciences. Um, and with what we study in all of these fields, among other things, it's hard to be inclusive because we cover a lot of ground, both literally and figuratively, um, are processes, people, and places. And um, I'll give you a good example of a geospatial science application that probably a lot of you use. If you used Google Maps to get here today, you know, a GPS on your phone, or if you used Yelp to find a good restaurant or coffee shop nearby, or, um, anything like that that ties a space to some data, uh, a place to some data, like where's a good coffee shop near me? Where's a restaurant near me? Where's a movie theater? Um, you're using an application that's geospatial science that's been deployed for the public. So it's out there, it's kind of like air. You breathe it all the time, but you kind of forget it's there. You might not even realize it's there. So, so we're sort of that silent partner in all of this. Um, I'm going to start, uh, I want to start to here early on and recognize the students. Um, of course, any research lab depends on its graduate and undergraduate students who do a lot of the grunt work and a lot of the, the non-glorious stuff. But um, Bailey Wolf was one of my students, I'm just going to highlight her today. She came to me as an undergrad, wanted to do a research project. Um, I talked to her, she has an agricultural background, her and her husband own a, own a farm. Um, and so she was interested in that. She was a geology major. So we decided to try to put all this together with some drones. So if you advance to the next, we should play a video. Oh, 
a lot of people, especially in like big agriculture right now, are using drones um, to fly. And you can see a lot um, about like what's happening with your crop. So you can see where maybe a spawn field is holding too much water or not so much water. I mean, it's, it saves a lot of time out there and then also just really reliable information. So to give you an idea, that's the drone we use for a lot of the work we do. Um, there's a lot of different drone systems out there. That one, uh, we bought it at Best Buy. And I'll talk about that a little later. That's an important aspect of why we're using it. Um, but also, how did we get here? How are we even talking about drones today? Uh, 10 years ago, most of you probably never even heard of a drone. But uh, the drone technology itself persisted trickle down to the military application. The Pentagon spent a lot of money developing uh, drone technologies, and like many things that they started doing, it eventually trickled down to um, civilian applications. There's a lot of theories, um, and uh, that we'll talk. I'm not going to talk about it so much today, but there's a lot of theories the way we turn data from a drone into science. Um, there's a lot of software engineering that went into uh, putting that theory into practice. And then one of the big things, even if we'd have had all this technology 20 years ago, we really couldn't use it the way we do today because of the computational power, the computing power that's required to do some of the higher end things. And then lastly, when I first started using drones in 2013, for the first four years through 2017, we didn't have any FAA regulations. We didn't know what was legal, what was illegal. There are a lot of court challenges. But now we have a licensure program. So I've got a, drone, a license to fly a drone. I know what the rules are. I can follow them. That allows us to take better risk management um, precautions and things like that. It makes it feasible as an organization to allow this to go on. Uh, you can advance, please. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the types of drones that we use. Uh, primarily, we're using multi-rotor drones. So these are like helicopters, except instead of one one rotor, there are four rotors. Uh, other systems may have six, eight, or 12 rotors. Um, the downsides of multi-rotors are they're short duration. They're not so short anymore. We get on this system 20 minutes of flight time. On some of the newer ones, you can get up to 30 minutes. So that's not bad. You can do a lot in that kind of time. And if you have extra batteries and a way to charge them in the field like we do, you can fly all day on that. Um, and the payload is not great. So we can strap an extra second camera on here, some other sensors, but we can't carry a lot of weight. So those are the limits. What, if you advance the slide, um, what the advantages are, they're very maneuverable. Um, they're easy to operate. I could train anybody here how to run one of these, how to fly 10 or 15 minutes, and you could be good at it in an hour. Um, they don't take much take off or landing space, really just as long as you have a footprint the size of the drone, you can do it. We've worked out in dense woods where we had a small opening and a few feet in the canopy, and we take off and land right through that opening. And then we could get up above it and do what we needed to. Um, this is important. These are less expensive than some of the all other systems like the fixed wings, which look more like airplanes, and they're locally available. You could go buy one today at Best Buy or Bedford Camera or Walmart. You can order it on Amazon. That's important because when I talk about transforming drones from flying cameras to scientific instruments, I'm interested in developing the applications or developing the methodologies and figuring out how to do those things so that I can give that, that knowledge to other people. So whether it's a farmer or another researcher who's not an expert in drones, but maybe studies wildlife ecology and wants to count deer or something like that, they don't want to become an expert in drone. They need somebody to digest all that and give it to them in a way that they can use it as a tool. So it needs to be cheap or economical is probably a better word. And locally available is good because if you need a spare part or if we crashed a drone one day a few years ago, we were working over by West Plains. We drove down to the nearest Best Buy that had it was in Branson. We took a two hour drive to Branson, came back the next morning, we were back in business. 
I have a fixed wing drone. It took a year from the time I ordered it to the time I took receipt. So there's a downside there. Um, and they're lightweight and portable. We can carry these into the backwoods where we need them. Um, this is a picture. So I was fortunate enough. I've been fortunate enough over my time at MSU with some colleagues to do some studies in Jamaica. Here we were actually interested in the coastline, which lost all its sand after a hurricane. So we've been studying the recovery of that. But what I really want to show you here, this is just what a picture from a drone looks like from about 250 feet up. So the drone's 250 feet above and hit the next, that little red dot. I'm just going to crop into that. So one more. So that's sort of what we can, if we zoom in and blow up that one part, sort of the resolution we're getting. Now this was 2016 technology. If you click one more time, this is 2017 and you can see it's even more sharp. So every year the cameras get better, they get sharper. You can make out feet and hands and details about the pool in this. So this is from 250 feet up. I mean, we can read license plates except license plates are usually oriented vertically. If it were laying on the ground, we could read it. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So in science, the way where this interface is, whoops. <laughs> um, in science where this interface is for me is uh, many, many field sciences, whether you're a geologist, geographer, archeologist, almost any of the other sciences, we're trying to detect change at the end of the day. We wanna look at something and see how it's changed over some period of time. And uh, what drones give us the ability to do is back here is to uh, one more. Okay, so this picture, this isn't a drone picture, it's just an aerial image, but you can see an active stream channel there. And then beside on, on the left or right of that active stream channel, you can see a bunch of small lakes that are ox, called oxbow lakes. Those are old meander bends. So this stream channels meandering and migrating back and forth and it abandons these old lakes. And you can see some of the lakes are filled with water. Some are just sort of scars in the landscape and they fill back in. So you can see that this is a dynamic system that's changing through time. You don't have to uh, have a PhD in geomorphology to be able to sense that. But we can't tell from this picture, this one picture, how much it's changed, how fast, when it changed. With the drone, we can go out there and after every flood or every year, we can economically capture imagery at a really high resolution and then compare that through time and we can quantify, we can put a number on how much has it changed, how fast has it changed, what rates, when. And when we know that, now we can start to tell you why. We can explain to you why this stream is more dynamic than a different stream. Um, and there are, uh, there are applications for this in climate science, conservation, ecology, forestry, agriculture, geology, geography, et cetera, et cetera. We can go to the next one. Okay, so I told you I started using drones in 2013. In 2012, I was doing, I got involved in a project. The Minnesota DNR and Trout Unlimited wanted to work on this stream called Garvin Brook in southeastern Minnesota. Uh, this is a this is a very uh, high, high quality trout stream, but the habitat has become degraded. So they wanted to do some restoration, stabilize the banks, do some stuff to make the, the bed a little, a little better. But they wanted to do a before and after survey. So they wanted a detailed survey of what it was like before so they could design based on that. And then after they wanted a detailed survey of the changes so they could look at the changes they made and use that for a basis for long-term assessment. So me and I only show one student there, but six, I'm sorry, eight undergraduates worked six weeks. All of those people working 30 or 40 hours a week to do the first survey, a really detailed ground survey using traditional ground surveying techniques. So eight students times nine bucks an hour times 40 hours a week times six weeks. It costs a lot of money to do that first survey. And that's not even including my time. Um, 2013, I got the first drone and I got it for a lot of reasons. But um, this was in mind. In 2014, when we came back to do the post-assessment of this, it took three people two weeks to do the same thing because we did a lot of the work. We just came in, took these high-resolution pictures with the drone that took one day. Um, then we had to go back. There were some things we couldn't measure with the drone. We did those over a few days. And then the rest of it was all in front of our computer where we could map out in great detail, actually higher detail than we did with the original survey. So the drone paid for itself just on this first project, just time and money. Um, 
once I got to Missouri, uh, we had big floods in April 2017, you might remember. This is uh, the White River just uh, east or just west of West Plains in uh, uh, near Dora, Missouri, if you really know your, your um, small town geography. You can see there is a bridge that used to go across there. The bridge is laying about 300 yards downstream of where it's supposed to be. So this was a big flood. It took out big areas of this floodplain. This is also a really dense forest. It's really rugged terrain. It's hard to get in there. We got a grant from the National Science Foundation to do a rapid assessment of the damage to the, to the national forest and to the infrastructure there. And the drones made that a lot faster because we, we didn't have to hike every single spot. We could just fly the drone, get the imagery, map it afterwards. Um, and this is an aerial photo we created of Sheely Farm, which is one of the university-owned farms north of Springfield. I have a grad student there who's, who's working on a project where he's trying to estimate biomass of the, of the grass that's out there. Of course, that grass is potential hay. So this is of interest to ranchers who are trying to estimate what, how, much, how many pounds of uh, hay do I have out there in my fields? And when I cut it, put it up, how long is that going to last me? So we're trying to figure out how to do that with the drone because the way they do that right now, if they do it, it's really um, equipment intensive to make those measurements. Um, so I haven't talked about this so far, but right now, so far I've been describing the way we take these flat, just regular pictures of the landscape from up above in a drone with our flying camera. But we also can make 3D models of the landscape with those same pictures. This is one of those technologies that, like Isaac Asimov said, is sufficiently close to magic. It's so far advanced, it's, sophisticated, it's, it's almost magic that it works. But um, it's been employed in a lot of things. This is a clip from the movie The Matrix, which is about 20 years old now. But um, that's not a real person. I mean, it is a real person. It's Keanu Reeves, the actor. But the way they did that is they took a lot of pictures, like hundreds of pictures from him from different angles. That's a 3D model. That's not a real person in a real world. That's a 3D model. And then they're able to spin that 3D model any way they want. That's why you see him doing things that it wouldn't be possible for a human to do and then the camera orbiting around. And on the bottom, if you look at the green, that's a point cloud. And I'm gonna talk about point clouds. And then they have draped that point cloud with a photo. So it's a photorealistic model. So that's not a real Keanu Reeves. That's a computer generated version of Keanu Reeves. We're doing the same thing with drones. And this is all kinds of applications and it's based on technology, believe it or not, that goes back to the 1800s. As soon as they had cameras, they realized they could do this. They didn't have the computers though to do it millions of times. Next one, please. So the way this photogrammetry works with a drone is, drones just flying cameras. We put the drone up in the sky and as it flies along, it snaps pictures and our stick figure here is our object of interest. Whatever our object of interest or study area is, we wanna get at least nine different pictures of it with the drone in different places. So I'm just showing three, but if you imagine like when you mow your lawn, you go down, turn around, you come back, you go down and come back. So as that drone goes down, we're making sure that those pictures overlap about 80%, side to side in front of the back, so that every point on the landscape in our area gets nine pictures at least. Once we have that, then the computers, you can go forward, can crunch all the numbers and we can make 3D models out of it. So this is Valley Watermill Dam, which is northeast of town. Some of you might fish up there or go out to walk on the trail at the Watershed Conservation Center. Um, and this is the actual dam structure. And the photo on the right, it's actually not a photo, in the image on the right, there's a bunch of blue rectangles. That's our lawnmower pattern. That's where the camera was when the drone took each picture. It flew back and forth. We got, I think, 88 pictures here. Those go into some computer software. We do some processing. And what you're seeing on the bottom there on the right, that's not a picture of Valley Mill Dam. That's a colorized 3D model. I could print that out on a 3D printer and we have a scale model of the dam. And the resolution on that is accurate down into this um, one to two or three centimeter range. So we have a high degree of accuracy. This is the same thing over here in gray on the, uh, the left side. But in this case, um, we didn't put the colors on top of it. It's just sort of shades of gray to show the three-dimensional topography. Um, the lakes out here, uh, this part's the road. This is the concrete dam structure and the sidewalk, the berm. That's a picture of the berm that you're looking at right there. So this is all 3D models that we can create. Um, let's go forward one more slide. Um, now, just to summarize, so 
the first hit the advance. The first thing to do this photogrammetry, we need three things. We need images that overlap. The next one, I didn't talk about this, but we need some georeference points on the ground. We just go out and we take GPS locations of some stuff that's visible in the imagery. That tells the computer when we make these point clouds where the X and Y and the latitude and longitude is. And then we get the elevation from the photogrammetry. And then the third is we need computing power. I jokingly put an Apple IIe up there from the early 80s. But the computers we do the processing on for the big projects, they're some of the most powerful computers on campus. And for the biggest ones, we tie 20 computers together and take over a lab over a break, and it crunches for days to do some of this. Go forward. Um, the applications for this, this is one of those pictures from the floods in April 2017. We were able to estimate the volume of woody debris, so the volume of the wood that got knocked, knocked down by the flood, because we have this three-dimensional model. Um, as I mentioned at Sheely, we're trying to uh, estimate biomass based on the 3D differences. Basically, as the grass grows, the 3D surface changes, and we can subtract one 3D surface from the other, and the difference is the, the height of the grass. Um, so change in time, uh, Tammy mentioned Gary Michael Felder, who will be doing work in volcanoes in uh, Chile. I may be going down to help him because we may be able to monitor the bulge in the volcano over time by taking subsequent pictures, all kinds of other applications. You can go forward one more slide. Um, this is a colleague, uh, hit, I think you have to hit advance more time, a colleague of, uh, in computer science and I, just as a sort of proof of concept, so this is sort of a rough draft. We tried to make a 3D point cloud model of the Plaster Student Union quad. Um, so the student unions at the top, Carrington's at the bottom, McDonald Arena is over here on the left now at the bottom. So I made a video just as I rotated the 3D model around on the screen. And in just a second, it's gonna zoom in on the side of Carrington Hall there. And uh, think about this from an architectural standpoint. Um, you know, if you were doing preservation or restoration on this building, um, we could measure in detail the wind, the size of the windows, how many num how many there are, what size they are, their width. If there was um, something need to be restored, um, architectural element that maybe had broken off and we needed to do, we could we could print a 3D model at scale and we make could use that to make a cast and cast a, a replacement, all kinds of applications for that. And COVID-19 has prompted some new things. So on the left here with the black background is just a picture of a calcite crystal, a common mineral that we, we have students learn in our labs. On the right is a 3D model. Now, in this case, instead of flying a drone around to get the pictures, we put the calcite crystal on a turntable, took pictures, rotated a few degrees, took a picture, rotate, put the, put the, the specimen upside down, do the same thing. We get 256 pictures processed in the same way. We get a 3D model and go forward to the next one. Um, this is one of the three. So we've got now dozens, maybe even a hundred of these 3D models up on this website. Students can access this to study their rocks and minerals at home in their pajamas if they want to. And uh, if you hit forward once again, Stephanie, um, they can rotate these around so they can do this. I, I'm doing this as an animation. They can rotate this around and I didn't show in the animation, but they can also zoom in. And this is really cool because in the lab, they can only see what their eye can see, but on the computer, they can zoom in and look at any of those little details in there. And we can put annotations on the website and we can take one of those little crystals and put an annotation around it with explanations or questions or prompts about what they should look at. So this is one of those things that even after COVID, it's gonna be an advantage to us because we can do a richer experience for these students than they can get simply from holding the, the same rock in their hand. They can actually study it in some ways better and so if we have both worlds after COVID, we'll have, we'll, we're a little better off. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so just to wrap this up, I, I titled From Flying Cameras to Scientific Instruments, and I gave you a lot of the examples of the ways we're using this technology. Um, but what's, what's my job here besides to show you a lot, a lot of fancy stuff? What I'm trying to do, as I mentioned, is I'm working on standardizing the methodologies for acquiring the imagery that's needed to do this, for standardizing the methodologies for how we process that data, 
And I'm especially interested in making sure that we can quantify the error values. So the difference between a camera and a scientific instrument is when you buy a scientific instrument, the manufacturer tells you, this is the accuracy and the precision. If it's a pH meter and you stick it in something to get the pH of it, you know that you get that pH within this much accuracy. But we need to figure that stuff out for drones if we're gonna do science with it. We need to know accuracy um, and precision and resolution. Uh, one more time, please. Um, but we need to make sure as we develop these standards and push them out to end users, that they're flexible because not everybody needs the same resolution. Not everybody needs to work at one centimeter resolution in the world. Um, we need different formats, different applications need different data formats and so forth. So we wanna keep that in mind one more time. But in the end, what we're after is making sure we have good methodologies that other people who aren't experts can use to get robust, reproducible data. And I like to think, I mean, it's not always, in science, most of the time we're interested about standing up to peer review in journals, but science also ends up in court. You gotta raise your right hand and say, I understand the accuracy of this data and these conclusions are based on that. So there's lots of reasons why we need that. One more. And this is something that's especially my hobby horse is making sure that the data we generate right now, the base data is just the photography, not the image. And then we process that into these 3D models, making sure that that stuff's archived and, and, and available so other people can use it. If you go one more slide, Stanford HAP, I, I mentioned that I worked in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, I did a lot of stream work up there. And one of the challenges of looking at the modern landscape and understanding why it's changed. In this case, it's a heavily agricultural landscape. And in the 1930s Dust Bowl era, lots of soil was eroded off of the fields, the agricultural fields. And that soil ended up in the stream valleys. Well, this guy, Stanford Happ, who he was a scientist. He worked for the US Army Corps of Engineers at the Vicksburg Lab, which is a really prestigious lab where they modeled the Mississippi River and all this. He had this side project where this was like his hobby. He was coming up to Minnesota and Wisconsin and doing these really detailed surveys of these streams. And he started in the 1930s and kept doing it through the 1950s. And then he, something happened. I don't know if he retired, died or something, but um, now, I've tried to find his other scientific, I know he published a lot of papers because I've seen paper copies of them. I can't find any of them on the internet, but this data is out there. And this data collection has been continued by scientists all the way up to current day. And it's one of the only windows we have into what this landscape was like in 1930. I don't think when Stanford Happ was doing his day job down in Vicksburg, he thought this would be what he's remembered for. I'm sure he thought all the great publications he put out was gonna be what he was remembered for. But I know the guy because of this data set. And it gives me some satisfaction to think of maybe a hundred years from now, this data we're collecting is gonna be useful to the people who are sitting here or maybe elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, that it will outlive us. Imagine if we had this kind of data from the Ozarks 150 years ago, how much better we'd understand the way this landscape has evolved. You know, if we'd had this technology and somebody to save the data. So, so I think that's one of the most important legacies we have with what we can do with this technology now. And that is the end. Thank you, Toby. We do have some um, some questions, and uh, and I'll start off uh, by one. And again, those on Zoom, you can just type in your question. But Toby, how much does a drone? And I know it's a a, a wide range, but what's a drone cost exactly? Um, anywhere from a hundred dollars for just something really basic that's more than a toy, but in that end to you can spend $50,000 on some really high-end fancy ones. The one that I'm doing most of my work with is about $1,200 is what we paid for it. So, and like I said, I'm interested in those economical ones because you can convince a farmer that he or she can use this data for purposes that will help their bottom line. And $1,200 is pretty minimal investment, but you know, $16,000 or $20,000 drones, a whole different thing. The return on investment on that's different. So. I'm really interested in that lower end because we can do great things with it. All this was done with a $1,200 drone. Um, another question came in, how does 3D modeling cost compare to LIDAR cost? Uh, maybe I better give a little background on that. So LIDAR is 
Another technique to get a similar type of 3D point cloud. So I talked about the 3D point cloud and 3D modeling. LiDAR uses a laser and it scans, the laser scans and it gets you the distance and so you can reproduce the topography. Um, LiDAR scanners have come way down in price. So they're getting closer, but they're still probably the, the cheapest LiDAR scanner I know is still 10 times more expensive than my drone at least, probably more like 20 times more. The data is a lot harder to process. And um, especially airborne LiDAR is not as accurate as the pho photogrammetry we're doing with the drone. Um, the terrestrial LiDAR, which is based ground-based, is uh, about the same level of accuracy, but it's a lot harder to do. And a lot of the people I know who do terrestrial LiDAR scanning have really are moving towards just using drones and doing photogrammetry like I do. I'm glad you explained what a LiDAR is. I just read the questions, folks. I, don't, <laughs> I hope I sounded like I knew what I was talking about, but, uh, but thanks for explaining that. Next question, have you done any water quality studies? A little bit of a trick question. I've done lots of water quality studies, but not with drones. Um, before I got into drones, I was doing some water quality monitoring and uh, before I came here. Um, but as I got into or to Missouri, as I transitioned down here, I've really focused on the drones. And so I'm not doing any water quality anymore. There are people out there who are doing some pretty clever stuff with sensor drone drone-based sensors to sense some aspects of water quality, especially turbidity, which is a measure of water clarity. So that's a visual, that's something visual that you can get with the drone potentially. A lot of work in that space. I'm trying to stump Toby here. Uh, <laughs> to what extent do the consumer grade cameras have sensors capable of generating broad colors and multi-spectral imagery? And then are you able to assess things like crop health or vegetation types using that? Um, the, the cameras on most drones, well, on all drones that I know of, uh, any consumer grade things are, are what I call an RGB camera, color camera, just like the camera you use, the camera on the back of your phone and stuff like that. Um, when we're doing agricultural stuff or forestry applications, including a project we have at Jernigan right now, um, we are using a multi-spectral camera. So that's a third-party camera and we're sort of strapping onto the drone. Multi-spectral, the camera actually looks at wavelengths that we don't see with the eye, like infrared. Um, so there's a, there are other bands and those tell, those tell you valuable information about crop health. Um, although the same crop or plant may look to you the same color green, whether it's healthy or not, until it wilts. When it wilts and it's brown, you can tell. But a, a green plant is a green plant to you or I, but in infrared and some of these other bands, that same green plant in those bands can be clearly healthy versus not. And so agriculture, in agricultural applications, they've used uh, multi-spectral for a long time. But what we do, now this is the interesting thing, the multi-spectral camera I use costs $5,000. But we strap it to a $1,200 drone and it works just fine. So. <laughs> All right. Any questions from our group in here? And we're going to have. Yeah. Yes, please. I, I know we've been talking about drones, aerial drones, but have you guys thought about or are there any drones uh, for cave systems? water drones that were it's too dangerous for people and especially in the Ozarks mapping all of our little cave systems are there any drones that can go underwater which would also possibly serve the purpose of uh, checking water quality but also map a cave system that would be too dangerous for people so I'll briefly restate that just so everybody in zoom gets it um, the question was are people using drones in caves or underwater or underwater in caves um, now I know that there are underwater drones that are out there. I'm not real familiar with all the things they're being used for, but I know they're being used as you were suggesting to do on underwater surveys, sort of like what we're doing above water. Um, I'm sure that you can easily incorporate sensors for water quality on that. Um, although I'm not specifically aware of how they're, you know, those examples, but it's a logical thing. I'm sure somebody's doing that. Um, in caves, especially, that's a great example for our caves that are underwater, but um, uh, air-filled caves, I'm not aware so much that people are using drones. People are using photogrammetry, but they're handheld. The photogrammetry works with any camera. We could use our phones, the camera on our phones and do a photogrammetric uh, survey of this room and I could process the data and we'd have a perfect 3D model or close to perfect. So people are doing that in caves with just handheld cameras. 
but it's tricky to fly the drone in the cave. I didn't get into it here, but outside we have the advantage. Drones have really sophisticated GPS systems that are really accurate, inertial navigation systems, accelerometers, and those are all redundant systems. So the drones, I don't fly the drone. I do once in a while just for practice in case I need to in an emergency, but um, when we're doing science, it's all autopilot. I mean, I hit a button, it takes off, it goes, we've got a programmed area and pattern, it flies all that and it comes back. It's harder to do that in a cave because there's no GPS. <laughs> uh, but there's movie applications. And usually once you see the movie in 10 or 15 years, it'll exist in the real world. So I'm hoping. All right, we've got a few more questions. Um, first of all, they said excellent presentation. So good job. Uh, one of the challenges yet to be sorted out in modern conservation is the ability to remotely determine between native grasses, vegetation versus non-native grasses. Could that technology help assess that remotely on landscapes? I'll say the three words that professors are never supposed to say. I don't know, but <laughs> I'll take a guess. Um, uh, because a lot of these, I, I'm not, not a botanist, but if there's a way to distinguish between them in terms of wavelength, like we talked about multispectral cameras, if the native versus non-native grasses, if we could, identify a wavelength signature, um, it's possible to order a multispectral camera. There's a company up in Minnesota that makes them to order. It can tell, I want these three wavelengths. And if we know those three wavelengths, tell the difference between this grass and that grass, then we could. Um, so that would be the research that have to go into knowing if we could do that. So it's at least hypothetically possible and probably could get funded. <laughs> A uh, question about how confident are we of precision and reliability of the data? Uh, are multiple test measurements, et cetera, one in most studies? Are there trade-offs of the value of verification versus cost of time, personnel, et cetera? So what's a typical procedure like? Yeah. Those are the questions I'm really, that are really important to me and we're trying to answer. Um, so it is possible to quantify your accuracy and your precision. It's going to vary for every study because you've got the height you're flying the drone at, the, the resolution of the camera, um, some of the choices you make and how you process the data. But um, the key is to have, have some um, standards. So what we use, we have those markers we put out for that we survey in with GPSs and they're in the pictures. And, and so we, we know based on the GPS within a centimeter where those are on the Earth's surface. And so we can calculate the distance between any of them. And then we can compare what distance the, that what distance is measured based on the model or the photograph we can create. And that gives us an idea of the accuracy and the precision and the resolution of the, um, those are all separate things, but we can, we can back all of that out. As with many things that are new, a lot of people rushed out and started using drones to do stuff. And you get this, you saw my PSU quad. I mean, that looked pretty good for something we did in a few hours. Um, but, uh, you know, and it looks really accurate. And if you've ever been there, you know that that's what it looks like. But you step back and you start to use that and you start to try to do science and you realize, wait, I need to know exactly how accurate that is. Can I order the new windows for Carrington Hall just based on those measurements, or do we need to go in and do some ground truth? So, so those are, yeah, we are working on that and it can be done and it is being done. Uh, another question, uh, would an increased resolution camera increase the accuracy of photogrammetry? Uh, and then also, does your drone allow you to update the, the camera? Um, yeah, within reason, we're limited in the US, the FAA only lets us fly to 400 feet. And what's happening is now the standard cameras are usually 20 or 25 megapixel in that range that are on the drones. So assuming the camera is a good quality, not all, not all, not every 20 megapixel camera is of the same quality. So some cameras are just better than others, even if they have that same megapixel, which is its resolution, there's other factors. But assuming all is equal, um, we're at the point where now we can't fly high enough to do worse than just a couple centimeter resolution because the camera now in Jamaica, there's not no such limit and I can fly at a thousand feet if I want in Jamaica. And then that high resolution lets me cover more area faster because I'm getting the same 
ground resolution with a higher resolution camera, say. Um, but we're sort of at that limit. Uh, the Phantom 4, the, the drone I'm using primarily, we can't change the camera on, but you can take the integrated camera off and strap different cameras to it. And we do that sometimes, and other people do. So, so we can upgrade those. I remember buying a drone for my son for Christmas. Didn't realize, uh, of course, it was like a 1299 drone, but I didn't realize all the capability uh, of that. So that'll be a great presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And uh, Toby is giving everybody in our studio audience here at home a free drone, a 1200 drone. Uh, so forgot to tell you that, Toby. Uh, but it is amazing the things uh, uh, that occur at the university. It's not just teaching classes out of a book. There's two uh, practical uh, uses. And, and drones are, are a thing, uh, thought it was a thing of the future, but it's really now a thing of the past and finding a lot of things to, to use drones for in, in experiments and certainly making the world a better place. So Toby, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, in the Meyer Alumni Center for those that are scattered around the United States joining us on Zoom. Thank you for, for being with us. It's uh, 94 degrees here in Springfield, Missouri. It's sunny. Uh, actually, it is nice outside and I was hoping we could go outside and test the, the drone, but uh, uh, it is a little windy out. But thank you for joining us. Thank you for Arvest for sponsoring our Affairs in the Know. We are back here in February, uh, February 3rd, and there's a lot of wild things, good things, new things going on at JPEG. And so we're going to give you an update about that on February 3rd. Uh, until then, be safe, and you can all go back to watching election results the rest of the week. Thanks for being with us.